And here we all are. A very good evening to everybody. Um, wonderful to see you as always. And uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Kaizen Central. And uh, it's been a very, very busy week. Um, I had a wonderful time earlier this week uh, doing an interview with Alison and Richard. And uh, this afternoon we, we finalized uh, the edit. And so that's going to go out tomorrow. So uh, we were talking about the uh, um, the virtual interns program that uh, uh, that Alison has developed and that uh, Richard has taken on board and is developing up there in the Northwest. So well done, everybody. Um, OK, the, the idea today to talk about industrial heritage and whether it matters and what we should be doing was really sparked by, as I think I said in the email, uh, two or three different uh, things, which when Sarah, uh, good evening, Sarah, thank you very much indeed for inviting Katie to join us tonight, Katie Andrews, um, because it, I've already been thinking about this, this issue around industrial heritage. Um, and you know, the, the, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry being turned into a, a block of flats. Um, you know, a, a, that, that kind of ticked me off a bit, <laughs> to be honest. And it's the oldest factory in England. And it, I, I don't know if you knew this, Alison, but it's the, it's the foundry where they made the Liberty Bell. And having actually seen the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, uh, and stood next to it and had my photograph taken. I, I sort of, you know, the, the, the crack in the Liberty Bell, it was uh, very, very emotional. And the Big Ben, the Bow Bells, all of that, the, the Whitechapel Foundry made them all and many, many others. But anyway, I, I digress slightly. We'll get on to, on to all of that because I, I just want to, to say that I think Katie is doing something um, of exceptional interest. Um, and if I can introduce or ask you to introduce yourself, Katie, um, in vision. Um, yeah, there she is. Hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, if you just, just let, tell people who you are and, 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 and the project that you're working on, because it, it, I think it speaks to something very dear to all our hearts. And, uh, as I say, I think it provides an excellent springboard, um, for what we're going to talk about tonight. So, um, I'm Katie. Uh, I'll look after marketing for a company. Sorry for my normal accent, by the way. But, um, um, a company called CB Plus. Don't I don't know, I, I like it myself. <laughs> um, I work for a company called CB Plus based in Chesterfield. Uh, but we have a big hand in STEM. And part of my job is promoting STEM subjects to kids um, and getting them involved in different projects um, to see manufacturing firsthand. Um, and we do a trip, uh, we do a big show called Get Up to Speed in Rotherham called Get um, by Workwise Foundation, where loads of different um, companies come and have interactive stands usually before COVID, um, the last 10 years. Um, I, I'll send you all uh, some information about that because that's also um, what will be of interest to you. Um, but through that, we met uh, Vulcan to the Sky. Um, and they've had ongoing projects for the last five, year, five, ten years to try and build a hangar for the plane at Doncaster Airport as they were kicked out of the old one. So we've started working together to try, to try and raise £4 million to build a new hangar, which will also be a heritage centre and a green technology hub um, and bring it all together. But to do so, we need companies to invest in, in it uh, we've, we're looking for 588 businesses to give us £3,000 each to raise the rest of the money. Um, and But the hub will, will be great. It'll showcase the historic side of aerospace. Um, it'll have rooms where kids can get it. it I don't know if any of you have been to Magna in Rotherham. Um, oh, it's really interactive. Have you been? It's good. So you, you can go in, press buttons, and kids can see how things work. Um and it brings it all to life. Um, so that's what we want to recreate, but in Doncaster. Um, and the businesses who invest will get a lot back. So it, it can be a free meeting space for people who are part of this. We're calling it the Executive Alliance. Um, so 
all the all the different interactions in it are movable as well. So it's going to be um, a big event space that you can hire. Or obviously, if you're a member, you can uh, use it free if, if you get involved in this early stage. Um, but it'll have different meeting rooms, different space. It'll be open to families. It'll, it'll be a really big, great thing for the community because um, there's nothing like that in that area at the moment either. Um, but, it's, but the aim of it all really, from our business point of view, why we've got involved is because it promotes engineering jobs to kids. Um, and we, we are big believers in apprenticeships. Um, not I think kids these days are pushed towards going to uni and not getting their hands stuck into jobs young. Um, so something as a manufacturing business we want pe kids to do is be interested in starting wheels young at 16 and working the wheel park and, and training wheels um, so yeah that's basically the project um, where because the hangar's not there yet we have are hosting two projects on our shop floor at minute we're in a partnership with Vulcan um, one's for primary schools and one's for secondary schools uh, we've got a Rolls Royce jet engine on a shop floor that we used on the plane. We've got wingtips and a fuel tank. So what the kids are going to do is work with uh, us on the historic artifacts and use our modern technology in the factory and do projects um, to improve them, basically. So how could they restore these with the stuff that's on our shop floor? and work with engineers and apprentices um, and get first-hand experience in business. So that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> that's good. Well, I think it's absolutely wonderful. I, I think that uh, your enthusiasm is. Uh, I was Sarah warned me. I think she she suggested you were quite an enthusiastic. Uh, <laughs> I love the fact that you're Katie Andrews CBE. Uh, that tells me that you're commander of the British Empire. That's fantastic. Well done. Um, <laughs> you've even got a plus after your name. Um, so anyway, let tell us how how this you, you've got. Are you going to put a link in so that we can pass it around? Yeah, businesses, I'll put it in the I mean, chat now. So funding wise, we needed to raise four million pounds. I think it's just over, but through government funding, through grants, through different uh, funding from local area, etc., we actually are three quarters of the way there. Um, so it's the final push now to try and raise the last little bit of money. We've actually broke ground, so we've started digging the foundations. We've got some funding in place, but we just need to secure it to make sure it is. We don't want it to be half half as good as it could be. We want it to be great and a centre where people can go and think, wow, British manufacturing is amazing. Well, yeah, you won't find anybody arguing with that here. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think individually and whatever, I, whatever we can do, um, we, we should uh, uh, we, we should do what we can to help and get the message out. I mean, I feel a particular um, tug, heartstring, if you like, by the Vulcan. My dad was RAF, and so I remember as a, as a kid, the Vulcans, uh, the V bombers, generally were just absolutely they they were superb. I mean, they were evidence of a a might once. Uh, that we once had and is long gone. Um, but, you know, thank you very much indeed, Katie. Oh, and tell us quickly what CBE Plus does, just so that we know. So, uh, we're actually a subcontract. So we, we our, the idea of our business is uh, integrated supply chain. So we do precision engineering, uh, but we also do electrolytic nickel plating and um, gear cutting, but for huge gears such as what's used in London underground and stuff like that um, and we've got as a metal testing service but we're in one factory and um, so the idea of our business is that you can come to us and cut out a lot of transport and time and cost for yourselves um, and we're, we're based in Chesterfield so we're basically central to South Yorkshire and the Midlands so we're in a really good position there but I'll, I'll also pop our our website in the chat as well if you, anybody's interested in having a look. Yeah thank oh, you. Great. Has anybody got any thoughts about what Katie was um, was talking about and any questions they'd like to ask her? 
or any suggestions about what, what else they could do? Because, uh, yeah, Philip, good evening. Katie, that's really, really great. Um, how, how, how did the Vulcan end up in the north of England in, in, in a facility? Is that, is that how, how did that all come about? Do you know the background or? Because obviously yeah, I, used to work, I used to work at uh, Filton um, for, um, for BA Systems and we used to have the Vulcan come in and out with the Olympus Rolls-Royce engines. So I, my, yeah. I, used to run, I, I used to run the gear manufacturing facility for Rolls-Royce that made yeah. the gears in the Olympus engine. So, so I'm fascinated how it, how it got up there. Um, I can't actually answer that question myself, but um, Michael Trotter, who is the CEO of Vulcan, would be interested in coming on this call as well in, in the future if you would like to ask him questions about everything. Um, um, and he's very passionate about uh, this we we work very closely together. Um, I'm not I'm not so invested in the heritage of the Vulcan. I'm more about getting the kids to be invested in it. But obviously, it's is amazing piece of engineering. Um, but I I don't know how we got to be at Doncaster. Is the answer? I know it's been up here for a while though. Um, Doncaster Sheffield Airport. That that's where it is. Yeah, it's at Doncaster Sheffield Airport. Um, okay. at, yeah. at the moment, at the moment, but it's not in in a place where it can be displayed. It's it's only safe sold. It's just a bit, basically in a big shed. <laughs> um, right. So we want to put it in somewhere where it can be displayed, basically. Yeah, uh, RAF uh, is that RAF Finningley? Michael, thank you for that. Because I, I, now you, because again, being an RAF brat, I remember all these places uh, by their RAF names, not by their uh, by their modern names. Um, I believe okay. so. I believe it was. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Katie. Thank you very much indeed. Anybody else got any thoughts about that? Um, I'd, please ask her or, 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 or yeah. points to make. Uh, any any questions? Um, if I can't answer them myself, I'll have to take them to our team. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to you and email you if you want to pop your email and, um, and your question in chat. Um, and I'll pop mine as, in as well if you've got any questions that come up later. Super. Okay. Well, obviously, I mean, as I say, the the, the issue of uh, um, industrial heritage and is is quite a um, I think it, it, it can be, it's, it's something that's incredibly romantic, but by the same token, um, as I think the story around the, the, the Whitechapel Bell Foundry um, suggested, it, it can also be, be quite emotive. Now I'm gonna share another, share my screen again. Um, this is um, a survey, well, read it for yourself, English Heritage did, um, more than 86 percent of adults uh, in England, this is, think it's important we value and appreciate the industrial heritage of this country. Reasonable sample size. Um, now, here are the actual findings. So 85 percent say it's important to identify significant sites for our industrial past so they can be protected value our industrial heritage, reminder of what made our country great, educational value, 75%, and because it can provide uh, direct links to our family's past. Um, there's only about a third on that one. Uh, people want to know more about what's happening locally, but the clincher of this, young people, younger people are less interested in industrial heritage than those aged 55 or over and that kind of i guess um really speaks volumes doesn't it because at the end of the day um if it's if it's something that only people who are older care about well i mean we around where i live um we uh we go to to this place quite a lot because it's absolutely wonderful i don't know if anybody knows the amberley working museum um, it's in the South Downs in an old chalk in old chalk pits, and it's absolutely rammed as always. Um, 
it's it's an absolutely fantastic place to go. And I know that um, there are working museums and industrial museums all over the all over the country. Can anybody tell me of one in their local area and whether they're particularly popular? Who's got one in their local area? Richard, evening. Evening. We've got Ellen Road Mill, which is the largest um, steam engine mill um, in the country or in the world. Uh, it, it was to drive the whole mill. The mill did burn down, which was a humongous mill. But the actual steam engines itself, and, and there's two of them that drive one humongous shaft. And from that, all the belts would then run throughout the whole mill. I think obviously West Yorkshire and Lancashire have got a huge amount of heritage from the first industrial revolution. So I think it's embedded within the actual culture of um, where people live. So our children and probably our grandchildren will still be interested in the heritage because the buildings are still there and they're still being used. It is disappointing, like you say, when a, what could have been turned into a fantastic museum was then turned into an apartment blocks, which will never go back. It's exactly the same with the Vulcan. It's quite easy to be able to just pull them apart and sort of say history's disappeared. We do need to hold on to the heritage because we learn from what's happened in the past to make us realise what we need to then do in the future. Uh, for I, I think everybody here is is we all look at the past, the, the history of of the great scientists, the direct great people of our country and that's what it's about is leaving that legacy behind and making sure that it's not buried or removed and I think that's what certainly I'm trying to do is to try and create a legacy of sort of say I've, I've made something I've done something uh, important to this world and this society. Yeah, I, I, I think oh. the thing that, that, that sort of is nagging me is that our industrial past, of course, by its very, very nature, it, it looks quite old and rusty and very large and clunky. And we're heading into a very, very digital, sharp, cool age. And I'm wondering whether the past has any relevance whatsoever to the future. And I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to poo poo. I'm, I'm as uh, in, in love with the past as anybody else and all, and I love the machines, but I'm, I'm just thinking, I mean, I know what Katie's doing and what so many people are doing is so, they think is so important. I'm, I'm, just, one, I'm just questioning, I'm just questioning whether we all think that our, our industrial past has any relevance to a, a, a green industry 4.0 future. Provocative Peters, they call me. Who's got some thoughts on that? Well, Nick, you would, you would never have the... Beverly, good evening. Beverly, good evening to you. You're on mute, Beverly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and I think uh, actually Adrian was just saying something, so um, uh, even in spite of being on mute, cutting across him, but and, and apologies for that, Adrian. Um, Don't worry. But all, um, I, said, I sort of uh, sent you a short note um uh, nick i hope you got it earlier in the week but i was very interested in your thoughts on this area and um i was uh, sort of um outlining how i'd done quite a bit of work looking at heritage brands and the industrial side from the west midlands so across a whole range of sectors whether it was bicycles and saddles you know brooks england saddles pashley bikes or arga range master cookers um or carpets from Kidderminster, Brinton's and Victoria carpets. Um, but but um, myself and my colleague, Steve, we, we wrote quite a lot of um, case studies of these businesses. And we found that a lot of them relied on craft heritage skills combined with super new CAD related skills as well. So for example, take medals in the jewelry quarter um, they, and, and jewelry in the jewelry quarter in Birmingham they would be using um, all sorts of um, CAD CAM uh, uh, skills and um, combining that with very traditional craft working in the actual making of rings and so forth. So the two live together very comfortably and actually enhanced the heritage that they had inherited and brought it to the next generation, um, perhaps with a, a degree of fashion. And same for ceramics with M Emma Bridgewater, who's taken that very traditional industry, but a modern twist on it, uh, incorporated fashion and design very successfully. So across the West Midlands, though, that we saw this in a, in a whole range of industries, uh, as I've just noted from interiors, cookery, um, heating, 
uh, bikes and transport and right through to Aston Martin that was still using, and, and JLR, Jaguar Land Rover, still using very traditional, um, for example, uh, sewing millinery techniques on the interior of the automobile. And it's probably the same for um, Bentley uh, uh, and, and um, Rolls-Royce, uh, but, but also obviously using the most modern production methods. You may, you. That is actually a super point, Beverly, because I remember I went around the Rolls-Royce factory. That's just around the corner from me here. Um, they're very proud to mention the fact I live nearby. And um, it's I, I remember going in there and discovering uh, with great joy how they were keeping many of these crafts alive, actually. Um, you're, you're right about the sewing, the leather work and... Uh, uh, and the woodwork are fantastic and beautiful stuff. And uh, that is, uh, um, you know, I, I, I just thought that was fantastic. Uh, no matter, you know, the, um, the cards themselves are fantastic, but yeah, and, I and love- the enameling actually in the jewelry quarter, um, you know, a, a company, very old, several generations company, Fatterini, were doing the enameling for the badges for Aston Martin. Um, and, you know, these very, very, delicate skills and uh, the science of it all and so forth, very precise, um, building on um, something that we were really world class at in the Victorian era and the arts and crafts um, and so forth. So um, I, I think, you know, it's the blend of them all that I think, and perhaps the lesson from Milan was that Milan was a sort of post-industrial area. And then they start, they really drew on their design uh, skills to um, invigorate and renew the industrial skills that they had and to actually um, bring into the 20th and 21st century um, their uh, industrial heritage. So I think it's sort of how we can do that really uh, now today that that is the challenge um, and remains the challenge I think to some extent. That's I, I love that. That's 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 terrific. Um, I know two chaps have got their hands up, but Adrian, uh, you 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 were asking oh. to talk at the same time when Beverly started. Yeah. Do you want me to go first then, Nick? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, there's the Catalyst Museum at Runcorn, which actually is a, a historical story of I, the building of ICI and the chemical industry of that region. Um, I've actually done some work there, and they've had one of these. Uh, um, grants to actually ex to, to actually extend it. So I think over the next couple of years, we're actually going to see that um, become a lot a lot bigger than it is. Um, also, the the Bell Foundry that you had, had mentioned earlier on, um, I think that's actually been featured on the Salvage Hunters program um, because I've seen Drew Pritchard go around a, fa a, a foundry, and I'm fairly sure that that's that's the one. Um, I, I'm a regular watcher of his programme and you'd probably be surprised at how many um, historical areas there are um, like that foundry, but other subjects. Uh, once you start digging, there's more than, you know, you, you would be aware of. Um, so I, I don't think we're going to lose it, but, you know, the ones that we have got, we need to hang on to them. Yeah, I, I, I suspect the, the, the difference is, I'm, I'm hearing what Beverly's talking about. She's talking about... Um, the maintenance and development and an upgrading and updating of, of, of old traditional crafts. Mm. Um, and that is a way of keeping the past alive. Yeah. Um, slightly different from, you know, old machines, which don't have any applicability. Yeah. They're literally there just to be looked at. Um, yeah. Okay. Could I, come, uh, could I come back and just very briefly, I'm so sorry to jump in again, but actually what I think was really interesting, and I don't know if my colleague Steve uh, wants to come in at all, but, but it's just that um, we went to Brooks England Saddles, and I don't know if many of you are cyclists at all, and whether you've got a Brooks England uh, saddle on your bike, if so, but these are leather saddles that apparently take a couple of hundred miles to uh, mould themselves to your individual shape. Um, but uh, but they use very traditional machines and um, sort of from the 1800s. And, and when we asked them about that, when we were, you know, several factory tours that we've done, they've said, oh, you know, the customers really like these machines and we could be sort of, you know, I suppose using much more modern equipment 
but our customers love the heritage. They love these machines. They love the character of the machinery and the modern machinery doesn't give it quite such a characterful feel. Mm -hmm. So um, even there, there was, whilst they did, you know, use all sorts of modern marketing methods and communications and so forth in that particular company, they were hanging on to the, the heritage of the production. I'm so sorry, I've sort of jumped in there, apologies. Okay, I'm, I'm, the, 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 the people who've been using the, the hands up sign have to respect their use of the technology. So uh, Harvey, go for it. Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. I mean, I think I think it's for me, it's not just about preserving those traditional skills, because I think one of the things that that is a real strength of, of UK manufacturing and engineering is its its ability to innovate, its ability to develop and create and move things forward. Um, you know, maybe as much as, if not more than any other country in the world. You know, when I worked in BMW, you know, it was one of the things that the Germans valued about UK engineers as, as composed to theirs is, is creativity. The same with the Japanese. You know, it's a contribution that we make. And I think that the heritage is both a reminder that we've always, you know, we've led the world. We've changed the world in these areas in the past. And that's inspirational, you know, back into, into Katie's work. You know, it's the stuff that inspires the innovators of the next generation. So it's not just about maintaining the tradition and moving it forward. It's, it's, it's an inspiration to creating the new as well. So that's, that feels to me, Harvey, like you're saying that even though the, the, you know, the, 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 the past has gone, it's, it's like a continuous stream and like a river of creativity that we can continue to tap into. And you, if, if you forget the river, then perhaps some of the inspiration dries up. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm thinking, Nick. Yeah. OK, thanks very much, Phil. Evening. Yeah, evening. Leads into my point, actually, Harvey, about innovation. Because a um, couple of things, um, there's the Aerospace Bristol um, um, Heritage Centre. It's got Concord. Um, and as Sarah said earlier, we have We've had a regional trade dinners right underneath Concord. Um, and you could actually then go in Concord and have a walk around. It's very interactive. It's good. I like RAF Cosford as well. Uh, we've run dinners where they've been hanging a lightning. They hang a lightning from the ceiling. And the point of the light, lightning was right above our table. And it was quite, quite, quite uh, scary to actually sit underneath that one. But um, I think their business models are struggling. Nick, I think that's the problem. Some some of the heritage facilities, and I like Katie's because you, you're diversifying and, and allowing rentals footage. People can go and use it for meetings and other. Some of our heritage facilities, because of COVID, they were really all around events, you know, and I've now and I've struggled. So the innovation that I was on about needs to happen in the heritage centres as well. They need to diversify and find other streams uh, of revenue and, 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 and think in a wider position. Um, that's just my, my, my view. But uh... Thanks very much. Ram, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Good to be back. I was almost getting withdrawal symptoms, to be honest. Um, right. So history and heritage, what we talk about, right? There is, if you look at events over a period of time in history or anywhere, events are across a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum, you have the absolutely glorious good things that happened. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the absolutely atrocious, terrible things that have happened during the course of history. Keeping these two events and these two ends of the spectrum in mind, everything else about history falls within these two extremes. Keeping that in mind, what history and heritage are about is number one, they serve as a teacher teaching us what not to do again in terms of not repeating the mistakes of the past. At the same time, history serves another purpose, looking at the glorious end of the spectrum, which is to generate an aspiration in, in the present and the future generations to go back and repeat the successes of the past and repeat the glory of the past. That's what history is, 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 is supposed to be used to in terms of the way I see it. And talking about innovation, the underlying human characteristic that has driven innovation over the period of time is resilience. When I talk about resilience, it is not just the ability to bounce back. It is the ability to, to be agile, to be flexible, to try different things and, and, and respond 
to change and respond to changing situations. I can see a glimmer of a smile on Steve and Allison's faces, but this is what I wrote about in my blog, the week went by. So resilience has been an underpinning characteristic that has driven innovation throughout time. And that's what history keeps remaining as that we are a resilient bunch. We've, every time we need it, we've reinvented ourselves and, and driven forward and moved forward. Look at technology around us, look at the pandemic. We're doing this on, on Zoom, sitting in the comfort of our homes. That's resilience, that's innovation. That's what history is there to teach us what not to do and what to do and how to aspire for big things. Yeah, that, that's, that's me for, done for now, so. Hey, not bad, not bad. I like it, thanks Ram. <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna go down the, um, uh, the, the, the selective celebration of, uh, of the past that's been in the news recently because uh, I'm, I always get tempted into being too political and I start throwing hand grenades and Molotov cocktails around and it's probably not very productive. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Lee, I can see you having a laugh over there. Michael, good evening to you. Good evening, good evening. Um, I just wanted to make two points, first of all. The first one I wanted to do was just about that, that survey, which I think you know, you maybe you highlighted as a as a provocative thing, but it, kind of asking young people whether they're more interested in history than old people is like asking young people whether they're more interested in Motown music than old people. Really, it's a, it's a kind of self fulfilling. It's not a particularly good question to ask. I think I think what's interesting though when we look, and I've done and did five years working as marketing director for a textiles group in uh, in West Yorkshire. Um, and West Yorkshire has one of the finest cashmere mills in the world, recognised as being probably one of three mills in the world that produce the finest cashmere. And you'll find it in a 5,000 euro coat in Louis Vuitton or whatever it is. They're, they're, they're weaving cashmere cloth. Um, but the fact that they were founded in 1767 actually gives them no right to be relevant today. And I think what we've got to do is we've got to inspire the young people of today. Yes, about what's gone before and how brilliant that we've been, but actually how we have some fabulous stories today that we are still producing the, the world's finest cloths for the world's finest suitings, jacketings in some of these modern brands. Um, and to, to, to talk about what, what Beverly said, when we talked about Joshua Kashmir, Joshua Ellis Kashmir. What we wanted to say was that we take the best from the from the future, like Ram was saying. We take those those craft skills still, but they're then updated as well. And so, whilst you may have the most modern looms that can produce this cloth, what you still need is that you still need a guy operating that machine who can actually pick the cloth up and touch it and and they have what they call the handle of the cloth and that is still skill and that's from 40 years of weaving etc cetera, etc cetera. but we should highlight our successes our how those those businesses are modern and relevant in today's marketplace and celebrate those successes i i think and 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 you know the, the the wins that we have, whether it's a small part for a fighter jet or 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 or, or, or a textile cloth or, or whatever it is, we should celebrate our wins to make it relevant for the young people, like we were talking about last week. Yeah, here, here. I, I, I think that's uh, that's very well said, Michael. It's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember who I was having the conversation with, but there 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 are companies. Um, creating things like jeans, for instance, and boots. Um, there's a great company in Hebden Bridge called Hebtroco. Um, they're the Hebden Bridge Trouser Company. And they're very funky, very uh, fine quality, really high quality. And people are prepared to pay premium prices. Um, not everybody's buying the one pound t-shirt at Primark that we sort of use as our benchmark for uh, our whinges about globalization. A lot of people are prepared to invest nowadays in in quality gear that that will last a very long time. And I, yeah. if if I'm detecting anything, I think that's that's kind of where our strengths lie in this country. We don't turn out tat, we turn out quality. And 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 maybe that is that that's where that thread, pardon the pun, uh, from the past um, is one. That we should weave into something stronger, I, and I don't know whose job it is. 
um, to actually make that happen. But it's, uh, again, it's one of those worthy causes, isn't it? Mm. And I, I, I did do some work with an agency that worked with heritage attractions as well. And we talked about what we were trying to do when we create a heritage attraction. And one of these visitor centers or whatever it is, is a heritage attraction. And what those businesses, and I, I, I presume Katie and, <laughs> and the team there, uh, what they're trying to, or, 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 or the Vulcan Center, what we're trying to put together there. People, choose, people have got a scarce amount of time. They've got a scarce amount of money. That heritage attraction has to say we're in the entertainment game. The alternative is that they could go shopping or they could go to the cinema or they could go those things. People need have made a choice that they're going to part with their cash. They're going to spend their time. They're going to go to the Royal Armouries or this sort of thing or, or whatever it is. And they need to work hard at making an emotional connection so that people go and they feel a sense of pride in British engineering. Or because my father flew, flew Vulcan bombers or was in the RAF or whatever it was, there's some sort of connection um, and that heritage attraction has to do that. I don't think that's the route, though, to inspiring our, our young people. We can learn from the past. And I think Ram made some great things. Learn, learn about the good and the bad and take the best from it and, and move forward, as we all do. Uh, but but inspiring a, a generation, I don't think those heritage places will do that. They will tell a story and make an emotional connection. Maybe they will inspire, but I don't think that's going to be a primary job. Ooh. Phil, you've got the hand up. Is is that because you didn't take it down? You're more than welcome to speak again if you want to. No, sorry. I'll take it down. So, okay. So we, we're sort of getting to the point where we're, we're, we're thinking, yes, there's, as Ram so, so eloquently put it, you know, pulling the, the best out from the past. So... What does that say about the future of, of, of UK manufacturing? Where are the opportunities now? Has anybody got any thoughts on that? Where are the, you know, where, where can we, yeah, Lee, good evening. Good evening to, to you, Nick, and all you wonderful Kaizen Central crazy gang. Um, the the future is going to lie in green energy, zero carbon, um, outputs, hydrogen, alternatives, hybrid vehicles, electric vehicles, urban air mobility, flying taxis, um, more electric trains, more electrification of things and, and mini nuclear stations that are being developed by Rolls-Royce at the moment. So the opportunities are not with your, your mass-produced zips like your your ykk zips they're they're still going to be made in far east asia but your power generators to make valves to, that can withstand up to 1000 bar of pressure to cope with the hydrogen so there's going to be massive opportunities within design within fabrication within machining within 3d printing and though it, it's we need more engineers coming through now. And I can't, I've, the, the biggest word I've heard here, and I've made a note, is we've all said, inspire, inspire, inspire. And we need to engage with not just young people, but the public to raise the perception of what we actually bloody do in this country. So we, we need to stop procrastinating, collaborate, get together as a nation of manufacturers, whether you're making tweed or materials, whether you're making jeans or boots, whether you're machining guitars, sex toys, missiles, cars, anything and everything, we just need to inspire them. And the only way to do that is to the interact. And I love the thing that uh, Katie and the gang are doing so you can physically touch and see it so you can relate to something. As soon as we can... This widget fits in this sports car. Oh, that's what it does. And it needs to withstand these loads, these stresses, these strains. So it can go around the corner at 180 mile an hour. Touch and feel. Um, that's We need more of that together. And um, thank you. I'm the one on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Katie. share my screen and show you all a video um what lee was talking about um get up to speed which i mentioned is 
is exactly what he was just talking about. Rolls Royce come, Tesla come, Shami come, they all have fans. It's a two minute video if you're interested in watching it. It's a great example. Yeah. It's something you can all get involved in. Yeah. This is 2019 because uh, we couldn't do, we couldn't actually hold the event last year because of COVID. It were online, uh, which has never the same impact. Um, I mean, the Guts event has obviously been now running for, for nine years. It's our ninth year, and it's an event that's grown over those nine years now to what some over 3,000 young people are going to be coming here to Magna. 25% of our workforce are made up of engineers, and another great lump are made up of material science. Both those skills, capabilities require apprenticeship schemes programmes, graduate schemes programmes. Welcome to the ninth Get Up to Speed Science, Technology, Engineering and, and Manufacturing Day. Well, we've spent most of our day looking, judging our competition with the primary schools, which has been probably even harder than building a theme park because the standard we've seen and have to make a decision has been really, really hard work today because there's been such creativity and such teamwork on show. It's been great to see in primary school children. What I hope uh, other people get out of this event is that employers get to interact with young people and get their message across. As I said in the panel discussion, we as a, we as a country need to make more use of our intellectual capital. Quite spectacular. It is a wonderful event. It gives children, young people and parents and teachers and employers the chance all to get together in one room at one time and for children and the young people to actually get some appreciation of what is on offer out there. I think it has a fantastic impact. I was saying earlier to someone that as we walked in, there were a number of the children walking around and actually going out, and you could see with the looks on their faces and the enthusiasm as they were talking to each other, that they'd obviously enjoyed their uh, time here. You'll see that some of the people who come here as students have gone on to get apprenticeships and jobs for employers who, who've exhibited here. So the, the system works. Whenever I speak to any of my friends, whether they're in education or business, I always recommend coming to this event because I think it's a good stepping stone for students and businesses to get to know each other and decide, especially for the students, what they want to do when they're older. We find that year on year it's been growing and the part of the reason for being here is also to show our support in trying to find the next engineers of the future and encouraging schools to promote manufacturing and engineering as a whole within their sectors. Wow. So I sit on organising committee for that event, but it is absolutely massive. Um, we're doing one as well, a bit called North Star, which is the same, but in um, a different area at country. Um, but that's that's just going live next year for, for its second event. Um, so if we can get stuff like this happening all over country, that's a long-term aim, uh, bringing schools and industry together is what we want to do and that's that is an amazing example of where it happens and and how we need how we need to go about it i think um and work-wise we organize that i've worked on the project for us so it's worked by cb and vulcan they're delivering education aspect where again our engineers um but they do some academies going to liberty steel taking kids around um shop floors and stuff like that so and kids i i, I work for liberty before cb plus Kids love seeing old-fashioned manufacturing that's dirty and a bit different, and then seeing actually this is how we do it nowadays. This is the part that's actually going to go and be an inside an airplane jet engine. Um, 
that's that's how you're engaging is give put it in context because you can look at anything and they don't know what, what's going on it, it's sitting with them and taking time to getting people who float open to come and talk to them getting everyone involved i think that's that's key <laughs> well can i come and visit you kt please <laughs> find out more <laughs> Uh, Marie Cooper, our CEO, is is up. We've got big facilities, big training rooms on our site. Um, she'd be happy to open a day where people can find out more about getting involved in everything um, and getting Vulcan in and WorkWise in. John Barber, it was um, WorkWise is a charity, um, but he's chairman at charity. Um, he's so passionate about all this. Um, and I work very closely with him too. Um, and I'm sure he'd love to meet a lot of you guys. <laughs> okay, so that is that work-wise you're, you're talking about? The, the Workwise so Foundation, yeah, and the organisers of Get Up to Speed, but they have a committee with all, all the different businesses on um, who obviously help make it happen. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. That's that's really, really good. That was, uh, that was quite an event they had there. And... Uh, yeah, I, I, I can see why uh, everybody gets very excited about that. Lee, we're expecting something similar from you down in Bridgewater in July. <laughs> he's, he's not yes, um, yes, I, I've, I've had commitment now from the local technical colleges. They're going to appear in, actually, when we first came on, um, uh, Ariel uh, have agreed to uh, participate, so we're going to have a a very inspiring sports car for people to dribble over and, and to engage with them. And I'm, I'm literally just about to engage with um, our partners because I've had to do bloody risk assessments and floor plans and health and safety and common sense gone out the bloody window, but um, we we're getting there and I'm about to finalize things. So um, I'm, I've, I'm going to be doing some subliminal posts on on social media so i'd be grateful if you could all just uh, look out for my name and tag and share the date uh and then the plan is is to for school children to come in um, engage with our suppliers and partners because we want to demonstrate that there's more to advanced engineering and manufacturing than a dirty foundry or a dirty little machine shop. We, we have a very high tech digital um, facility. So we're aiming to be and will be paperless completely by October. Um, so that everything's done digitally, literally. So people can choose to be designers, CAD CAM programmers, CNC machine operators, five axes, metrology. Yeah, there, there's lots of great things. And the colleges are going to be at the end. And fingers crossed, we'll have a bit of a networking event at the end of it and where the grown ups can um, let their hair down a little bit. Can I, uh, Alison, can I ask you a question? I'm going to put you on the spot. I always do this to you, but you are, you're, you're, you're over there in the United States. And I'm wondering if this has any resonance whatsoever in terms of industrial heritage. Uh, in the United States, does the same mindset apply at all, do you think? There is, there's a little bit, I think, of, um, and I, I believe somebody talked about it in the, in the notes, might have been Richard, uh, talking about UK taking history for granted. And I think I really did feel that to a degree because, um, for example, I, when I visited London years ago and I went to the Churchill War Rooms, I remember thinking, I remember being underground and thinking, wow, we don't have anything like that. We don't have anything like this. And yes, there, of course, there were um, details having evolved with World War I not taking place actually on US soil and it did over in Europe. But besides that fact, um, there, our heritage feels newer compared to a lot of the rich history that I think the UK has. Um, I feel as though our industry museums, um, they, they kind of juggle that dichotomy of having to attract people to come in and pay that ticket price. I mean, why... Would you want to pay, uh, you know, $25 US dollars to walk somewhere and see something dark, dirty and dingy if you weren't already involved in that industry and appreciated that? Or do you want to pay the $25 and go in and see something new and cool where you can take pictures with your iPhone and put it on social media and all this? So there's there's that dichotomy. There's in the US too, there's a um, we're very region specific as, as with anywhere else, I imagine, but 
for like Detroit area, they're very known for cars. And so they, I feel, do a better job in keeping that industrial heritage alive. Oh, some of the automotive, some of the old school automotive. Um, and then they play it up and kind of make it, you know, a cool place to work and live if you're you know, around the old auto plants, that kind of stuff. So um, I, I really, I, I feel for those trying to market this because it's, it's a really tough balance. It's, we want everything to be new and cool, but old industry is not new and cool. It's old and cool. So how do you, how do you balance that? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very fair point. And uh, yeah, uh, how to balance that in, is entirely the, the issue, I think. Ram, are you, are you, were you waving your hand then? Or the, oh, Steve, good evening. Uh, how are you doing? Yeah, um, uh, uh, I like all, I like, I, I, no, I really do like all the positive stuff and all the, I thought that video was absolutely brilliant. But um, I, th I think there's a bit of a, a concern that we have to bear in mind is that there are also negative forces. In other words, I think in, in the Bell Foundry, why, w w were there not hundreds of Bell Foundries in London, Nick, I think? So why, why, did, why did only one survive? Or all, why did only the spinning Jenny survive? And, and there was a huge amount of competition. So if we're, if we're going to attract young people in, in, to being innovative and, part, and be part of innovative um, innovative organizations that they only have to have the slightest grasp of history to realize that most of these are going to fail so i would say that, that we don't actually do a really good job of, of training people to be innovative and and, tr and training them to fail because it's all part of the learning and creative process so i i just i just don't think that the the picture that goes across describes the whole process that people are going to have to expose them to clearly enough. And I find, I, I just find, I suppose I would have found that uh, when I was young, I would have found that unrealistic. And then to an extent, I think I, I find it slightly unrealistic now that we're under underestimating what people, what the our young people can do by just showing them the bright and shiny side. We don't actually really give them the opportunity to display their resilience, and I don't, I don't find the picture that we're presenting, um, what you might call it, clear enough, you know. And I, I just think the whole pic, the whole picture is more revealing and more engaging. But that's my opinion. So a, a more Darwinian view should be encouraged. That. The, well, to, the, to the, an the extent, it is. I mean, I, I've done, I've done PhDs and stuff, and you know damn well. That your chances of winning a Nobel Prize are like uh, four tenths of a Nat's cock to one, or whatever. You know what I mean? Ah. But the thing is, people still go out and do it and challenge themselves. Realize that you know you might just learn a lot of useful stuff. Um, so I, th I think we we we're, we're almost um, not getting people to engage in the hard parts of the process that will really develop them. And it, to an extent, it is no. But to an extent, you're right. It is Darwinian, and Nick, because some people just nicked ideas off others. Some people were just good at politics. So there is absolutely there is a, and it's not and it's not crudely Darwinian in the sense of the 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 survival of the the person with the crude strength. But you need a certain amount of political nous to to organise financing. You need political nouns to, nouns to work with governments. You need organizational nouns. So to an extent it is, what survives is, is the survival of what has the ability to survive, which is not necessarily the best. And okay. we don't, we're not engaging, we're not engaging people in some of these challenges. And it, it, I don't know, I don't, I don't think it worries them. I never, I never messed about with 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 my kids in in terms of uh, being realistic about the challenges that they were facing, but it never seemed to put them off much as I tried probably. But, um, so I, I think I think I'd like to, to 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 propose we maybe think of a more realistic process. I'm, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you quickly, Stephen. Just what does that look like? I mean, you you say challenge. I mean. 
how would you adapt what's happening now? What would it actually look like in real life? Well, okay. Start off with so, if, look. Look at look at more in uh, more in the detail of history. Let's let's take it. Let's take an example of um, I'll say a uh, new Lanark, which is just over on just just south of Glasgow. Uh, new Lanark was new Lanark was a model a model um, model society. They they taught their they looked after their staff, but ultimately new Lanark, in terms of its its cotton making, failed because of cheap imports. So it, it gives you the lessons that if if we want to compete, then we have to not just be be make these great quality things, but we have to make them cost effectively. And we um, let's try and think of if you think of the auto industry, think of the auto industry. Yeah, we were we were top of the world when there wasn't much competition. But as soon as the competition came along, we had to start adapting, and we and we did and we had people in the auto industry who had lean decades before the Japanese, but we never engaged it. We never engaged with it. And ultimately, the, 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 so we, we didn't actually embrace the things that were new. So we didn't embrace lean when we could have. So did we, what are the, what, like, okay, how effectively are we embracing the 4IR four, four now? So what would it look like? That picture would say, okay, we have an opportunity. If we don't embrace 4IR, then probably a lot of industry will go the way of the auto industry. Okay, thank you. Ian, good evening. Good evening. Um, just really picking up on Stephen's point as well. There's been a fantastic film, a documentary made recently on the motor industry in Coventry. And it starts right back in the, you know, well, dame the days, really, starting right back with the very, very early carriages. But it goes all the way through to Jaguar Land Rover turning over to this electric vehicle model. And it's quite interesting to see how it's all evolved, but also how the people of Coventry have evolved with it. And there are links to all the different makes that were there. So people like Riley, like Alvis and all that, there's very strong links to those still. And those links are beginning to pull young people back into the motor industry. And that's on two levels. First of all, it's attracting people to the new technologies. But secondly, getting kids going and doing apprenticeships to learn how to use things like the English wheel. So Alvis has started producing new old cars. So they need the old skills as well. So it's been quite an interesting sort of thing to see and see how it's going on. But it's an hour long program, but it's absolutely fantastic. And you can see the step change as they go through. And as Stephen said, they had lean back in the 1920s and 30s to some extent. And it actually got lost when people started to copy the UK products and they actually did it better. So it's, it's quite an interesting programme. Where would we find it in? It was shown on Channel 4, so it should be on one of the catch-ups. Brilliant. Brilliant. If you can if you remember the name, do, you know, um, was it on recently? It was... Yeah, it was, it was on maybe two weeks ago. Okay, all right. Yes. Dig around. Well, it's coming towards the witching hour. Uh, I don't know if anybody's got any final thoughts or um, any, any extra bits they want to add uh, to the conversation. I'd, I've taken, um, I, I really enjoyed it. I've taken some good insights out of it. Um, having started slightly conflicted uh, I, I, my, my, the conflict in my head is resolved thanks to you fine people and all the uh, the great ideas and the great stories you've been telling um, Katie thank you very much indeed for coming along and telling us all about the the Vulcan project you're free to come anytime you like and bring anybody else with you we're we're reasonably friendly bunch few of us bite um, and uh, we're just delighted to see new people come along and share their views and their thoughts. Um, any final thoughts? Ho speak now, forever hold your peace. No? Oh yes, Michael. Michael, you've got two minutes to eat up. I won't take two minutes. I won't take two minutes. I, I, I was listening intently to what Stephen was talking to and uh, talking about and the, and the manufacturing that we've got. When I, when I think about um, manufacturing, I, th I think about UK manufacturing as being innovative and creative and being able to adapt. Uh, but we also have to be able to create a product that people want to buy for a price that they're willing to pay. 
And we have to recognise where we can win and where we can't win. And I think the gravitation in the UK towards quality production, so like, as we talked about, the high-end cashmere or whatever, was because we still have the skills and we have to create a quality product to be able to put those skills in rather than the the kind of dumbed down manufacturing that you would see over in in the far east or whatever where they're you know we're producing fabrics that are uh, wholesale at 100 pound a meter and the fabrics are going to your suit that goes into next is is being sold at a pound a meter you know it, we just can't manufacture at that sort of level and so we've got to find what we can produce what we can win with the skills and the and the lifestyle that that our workforce needs etc and and create profitable and innovative and creative businesses in some of these um, sectors that uh, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, th- I think there are opportunities for sure, because there are plenty of success stories and we need to shout about those. Well, you have very successfully eaten up those two minutes, Michael. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> No, you t- you take us to seven o'clock, and as always, uh, is uh, we 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 vow to get out on time. So thank you all very much indeed for coming. If this was your first time, bless you. If you bring people along, we love to see uh, uh, new faces. Um, Thursday six o'clock every Thursday six p.m. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.